Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second lecture in historical theology. We're talking about the doctrine of God and the Trinity. Um, those of you that are new, I have a slide up there that kind of lays out the course objectives, so please feel free to read through that as we get started. Uh, first, I'm just going to recap a little bit from our last lecture, and then we'll talk through what we're going to cover today. So, in the last lecture, we looked at historical theology as a discipline in contrast to systematic theology and biblical theology. We then started with the ground of theological reflection, which is God himself and all things in relation to him. From this, we covered metaphysics, the branch of philosophy that investigates what is real. And we said that theological metaphysics is the account of the ontological nature of reality that emerges from the theological descriptions of God and the world found in the Bible. And then we went to Romans 1, 19 and 20 to see how God has given us language of creation to discern his incomprehensible essence in a manner that we can grasp. And then we concluded with some texts of scripture about God, which the church has contemplated, formulating descriptions and concepts um, aided by philosophy. At the end of the lecture, I mentioned how modern critics of classical theism assert that the early church fathers were Hellenized, meaning they adopted Greek philosophy wholesale and then formulated doctrines that ultimately did not align with the Christian scriptures. And then we stopped there and I said I was going to cover that criticism here in the next lecture. So in tonight's presentation, we're going to talk about the Hellenization thesis, God as cause and first principle, and the essentials of Christian Platonism. Now that, that phrase, Christian Platonism, uh, a lot of people have problems with that, but as we, as we go through this, I think you'll see why that term, in a sense, kind of helps us. Um, it's a good term for what we, what we understand about uh, the nature of reality, about God, what the scriptures say about God, especially when it comes to talking of God's essence, the Trinity, the hypostatic union, uh, that kind of thing. So, the Hellenization thesis, it's a dubious idea that resurfaced in contemporary theology most pointedly from those who are open theists or open relational theologians, and even in, in what we call process thought. And to borrow, uh, Paul Gervilliak wrote a really good book kind of challenging this, but he, he termed it the theory of theology's fall into Hellenistic philosophy. I'll make it to the slide. I forgot about that part of it. There we go. So the Hellenization thesis as it became uh, originated in the early 19th century in Germany, most notably in the widely acclaimed lectures given by church historian Adolf von Harleck, Harnack excuse me, in Berlin in 1900, and it became published in English as a book called What is Christianity? Now, according to Harnack, Greek philosophy, particularly Platonism, did not only have an ethical system of influence on the early thinking Christians, he says there was, quote, a cosmological conception that the church took over, which was destined in a few decades to attain a commanding position in its doctrinal system, the Logos, end quote. He says the Logos became the active central idea, a unifying of the supreme principle of the world, of thought and of ethics, but it also represented at the same time the divinity itself as a creative and active as distinguished from a quiescent power, end quote. Now, maybe a little challenging to understand what that means, but we'll talk through it. So, so this idea that took shape between Greek philosophy and Christian, and Christian doctrine was that the Logos equals Jesus Christ. And that it was the idea that served as the vehicle to propel Christianity into the world from its Judaistic roots. He says it amalgamated the Christian gospel with the Greek spirit, the Logos, into a philosophy of religion. Right? Thus becoming a system of ecclesiastical doctrines or dogmas by which the church conquered the ancient world and educated the modern nations. Now he said this form of institutionalized Christianity advocated strict conformity to its dogmas for one to be in orthodoxy. And in this Hellenizing of early Christianity, particularly in Augustine, critics contend that it influenced how the Bible was interpreted, not letting the Bible 
speak for itself through a plain reading of the text, as they assert. So the critics say that now, in the theology they're advocating, comes from a very plain reading, a very literal reading of the text. Uh, but as many notorious um, thoughts have come from this, uh, just as many um, eminent theologians have come and responded to these criticisms. But um, I won't go through all that, but it's been... This thesis was uh, refuted by many eminent scholars in the 1900s, notably J.N.D. Kelly and H.E.W. Turner, and it's really no longer taken uh, serious by any historians. Um, open theists, again, they're the ones that kind of brought this to the fore in the 1980s, um, 90s, and 2000s, and I said there's a there's a, a, a an incredible amount of response to this from uh, evangelical theologians, uh, reformed and non-reformed alike. Right? These are some basic things of, of the Christian faith that we understand as we look at the doctrine of God, the Trinity, a deity of Christ. And so to say that this foundation that we have for these essential truths of the Christian faith were built on Greek philosophy is really, really a, um, a wide, um, what do you call it? Not a wide, but a, a, a looking way too into, look, looking over things that, that shouldn't be looked into. Uh, that didn't make any sense, but I'll keep going. <laughs> but... So for these opponents of classical theism, the doctrines of divine immutability and impassibility are constantly in their crosshairs, and we'll get to those a little bit later. But for classical theists, they are the most heavily guarded. These and the other classical doctrines function as a tightly connected metaphysical framework of the Christian doctrine of God grounded in Trinitarian Nicene Orthodoxy. Now, Nicene refers to the fathers of Nicaea, uh, ultimately the orthodoxy that came out of exegesis, metaphysics, contemplation of the scriptures. And so we would affirm again that the, that Nicene, Nicaea, what happened there, referring to the Council of Nicaea especially, uh, is orthodoxy. <clears throat> now, my view is that modern theology proposes a, an anemic God who is nothing like the God of the Bible. But I believe if the church is to move forward, it must look back and drink from the wells of the early church fathers, the medieval doctors, and the reform and post-reformers of the Christian faith. And we are currently seeing this kind of resurgence of the doctrine of God and going back to these sources, if you will. Another, which we call the ad fontes, which is the Latin for back to the sources that we saw, which really propelled the the, the Reformation. <clears throat> so, in conclusion of this section, the refinement in the metaphysical language used to explain what the scriptures teach about God allowed the church to be more theologically precise, which ultimately does lead to dogmatic assertions. But again, these dogmatic assertions are built upon a coherent understanding of Christian scriptures. So the emergence of the classical doctrine of God, as we will talk through, it came about through an intense theological and philosophical friction during the early church. And basically what was formulated in the first three to 400 years of the Christian faith became the continuous orthodox expression of the Christian God of the Bible up until the Enlightenment period in the 17 to 1800s, which Harnock is kind of on the, on the edge of that more into the, the little, the Protestant liberals in that forms in the 1900s. But the Enlightenment period is, is really, really a pivotal turn in Christian doctrine. And I'm going to have an entire lecture dedicated to looking through that and seeing how that actually influenced uh, modern thinking. So, however, the Enlightenment as a movement has passed, but its vestiges remained and that it placed a metaphysical stamp on Christian theology in the years to follow. Now, while many will say contemporary theology has loosened its grasp of systematic and dogmatic theology, Due to a change in hermeneutics, I believe it goes much deeper than that. I, I call it a metaphysical metamorphose, which is goes at the deep level of how people, Christians, see reality. So, we're now going to move into one God as cause and first principle. And again, this is an important part as we're jumping into the foundation of philosophy that the early church fathers were critical of, but adopted the key concepts to help formulate and strengthen strengthen our doctrine of God, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and whatnot. So, drink real quick. So the early church continued in the tradition of the New Testament in its conceptual understanding of God, 
But in the first generation, those following the apostolic age, we find reflections of a, of a phys- philosophical theology that starts to emerge. And those such as Clement of Alexandria, Ignatius, Justin, Athenagoras, Athenagoras, or Athenagoras, <laughs> if you want to say that, Irenaeus, and Tertullian. Now, when we look at their writings, we do find the similar attributes that we find from the New Testament. God, Lord, Father, Most High, Majesty, Almighty, Master, the Holy One. But then we also see these other designations used for God. They say the Great Demiurge, uh, God of the Powers, and the All-Creating God. However, the fundamental ideas on God are almost exclusively derived from Scripture. We call these these negative adjectives. So, Colossians 1.15 speaks of invisible. In Romans 16.26, eternal. And Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15.50, imperishable, right? So this is, these negative adjectives are used to speak about divinity. <clears throat> and therefore, though some scholars do not want to admit, elements of Hellenism were actually prior to the New Testament writings. With that said, as we will see following the New Testament era, Philosophical constructs began to form in Christian theology, thus producing a type of language, now albeit foreign to scripture, yet necessary to precisely define true Christian doctrine to protect what scripture teaches about God and Christ. But first we're going to detour through Christian or sorry, through Greek philosophy, again the foundational scheme of thinking that during the birth of the church. Now, while modern critics of classical theism attempt to discredit it as a biblically valid theological model, asserting that the early church fathers took Greek philosophy wholesale into classical theism, they were ultimately greatly mistaken. In fact, the fathers were quite critical of pagan philosophy, only appropriating that which functioned as a supportive metaphysical framework to articulate biblical truths. Now, moderns, while they are claiming to be more biblical, they are merely exchanging one metaphysical construct for another, which they have uncritically accepted. And we know that that metaphysical construct called Hegelianism or Hegelian philosophy. Now, Hegel was a German philosopher that grounded God's nature in the unfolding of history. So whereas a classical view that, that utilized Greek philosophical concepts, we would say that God is. Now, we actually have a foundation for that in Scripture, right? When God says, I am who I am, right? That's the verb, to be, is. So we say that God is, based upon that, Hegel- Hegelian philosophy says that God is becoming. Becoming. So God's nature, who he is, unfolds as history itself unfolds. So what it means is that history and God are in a sense one, and they they the we see God you know in a sense come through history and become becoming, but we never actually see him finalized. There's no actuality to it in a sense. But this idea of history became very popular in the 1900s, and process philosophy, open theism, and other kind of other aberrant forms of philosophy that was trying to somewhat Christianize itself. Uh, really kind of grabbed onto some of these key principles as a metaphysical framework. Again, you, you can't do theology without a metaphysical framework. The key is, is what makes most sense of the scriptures. And again, what we see in the modern theological scene with utilizing a different kind of framework, a metaphysical framework, is that these same Christian theologians are trying to hold to the same doctrines of the of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the, the Spirit, all these key things about God that are foundational to the Christian faith, but yet are trying to utilize a different metaphysical framework to uphold those very doctrines. And it is a blunder for sure. And there's so much that has come against it. My doctoral research uh, challenged one of the more, more uh, contemporary forms of it, a relational theism. So um, that's what ultimately we're going to see as we also continue to to go through this course. So, all right. The one first principle, simple and unchanging, the grounding of Greek philosophy. The concept of first principle of all things is the foundation of Greek philosophy. The first principle was not a god, but rather it was an it. Aristotle categorized early philosophers into those who saw that all things derived from it and those who did not. 
The first principle, while having variation in exposition, is commonly understood as the first point from which a thing either is or comes to be and is known. And this first point is the beginning of a thing, the nature and essence of a thing, the element of a thing, the thought and will of a thing, and the final cause of a thing. For the good and the beautiful are the beginning of both, of the knowledge and of the movement of many things. End quote. Now that was from Aristotle's Metaphysics. <clears throat> so ancient philosophy understood the complexity yet the simplicity of reality. So in saying that there is a first principle of all things, presented the puzzling concept of the one and the many. And in Christian theology, this was an important aspect that it too needed to account for. Among the Greeks, the discrepancies arose in that some overstressed one aspect over the other, thus losing the grounding principle. Therefore, Christianity found Greek philosophy unserviceable as a prime resource, okay, a prime resource for delineating the inner nature of God, the, the doctrines of creation and the incarnation, and ultimately the relationship of God to man and the cosmos. But to jump ahead to the conclusion, the church father's emphasis on the logos as the creative source of all reality, the metaphysical framework of substance and being, they, again, the church fathers, metaphysically guaranteed the general possibility of the correspondence of divine and human thought about God, the world, and other selves, and did so by avoiding pantheism. Now, pantheism says that all is God, and that's where the Hegelian philosophy, kind of since, is now going to be pretty much up against the wall of saying that's going to be the conclusion that one has to hold to, is that all is the same. There is no distinction. There is no one of the many. <clears throat> but we have a God who is one, but yet three. So the one and the many cohere together in the Lagos. And that's where the early church fathers jumped on that principle of seeing the Lagos obviously manifested in the person of Christ Jesus. Now, again, when I say the Lagos, we're not referring to the, to the Greek Platonic strict understanding of it. Obviously, we read the Gospel of John, and John uses that language. Now, the Lagos, though, has a, uh, a very... Um, wide range of uses and understandings of Greek philosophy, we find it within the Hebrew, th in Hebrew thought itself. And so it's not just something that's strict to Greek philosophy. It has a foundation in the Hebrew ideology, and then we also see it in Greek philosophy. <clears throat> All right, where was that? Okay, so, but the one and the many framework led to the question if there are one or many gods. Plato did not think that was important. He argued that all bodily movements must be dependent on a previous movement as in cause and effect. But then you have a problem. The chain of events of physical causation would flounder off into infinite regress. Why is that? Because if I move you, who moved me? Who moved the thing to move me? Who moved the thing? Who moved the thing to move that thing? And who, see, it just keeps on going. Whereas there's somebody always anterior behind that causes this move to happen. But where is that first cause that doesn't need to be moved, right? So Plato said the cause of a physical body's movement stems from the soul, which generates its own movement and is responsible for the movement of the entire cosmos. He says the soul is prior to the body and can exist without a body. It is the cause of the good and all the bad things in all aspects of morality. It dwells in all things, controls all things that require movement. Thus, it is the cause of all things. Excuse me. He says it drives all things in heaven and earth and sea by its own motions. A similar argument of controlling, of all controlling divine soul. Let me rephrase that. A similar argument of the all controlling divine soul led to one first mover in Aristotle who said, quote, since change must always exist without failing, there must be a first agent of change, or perhaps more than one, which is eternal and unchanging. Something eternal, which is impervious to and utterly free from change, must exist to initiate change on something else. And that was from uh, Aristotle's Physics. So he notes, 
It is possible for things to exist and not exist, even if self-changers, as he calls them, that follow this process, there must be something which includes them all and is separate from every one of them. And it is this that is responsible for some things existing and other things not existing and for the continuity of change. And he calls this the prime mover or the unmoved mover. Uh, advancing on this concept of the source of motion, Aristotle writes, There is something which is eternally moved with an unceasing motion and that circular motion. Therefore, the ultimate heaven must be eternal. Then there is also something which moves it. And since that which is moved while it moves is intermediate, there is something which moves without being moved. Something eternal, which is both substance and actuality. End quote. And this mover who was both substance and actuality is what they call, he calls, the first principle. The first principle is necessarily existent and is necessarily good. And I will let Aristotle carry on as he arrives to a, a very glorious conclusion about God, though he could not link it to the God of the Bible because he was not given that revelation. So I'm going to go through it. And then we'll see when he concludes, and you'll, you'll hear his, his final sentence, and you would think, wow, this is an absolute orthodox statement of the God in the Bible. But unfortunately, um, God never gave special revelation to him. But let's go through it. So he says, <clears throat> Where's that? Uh, let's go back a little bit. Here we go. Okay. And the first principle must always be in this state since its actuality is also pleasure. He's talking about being good, right? To, to be in a state is good. And for this season, I'm sorry, and for this reason, waking sensation and thinking are most pleasant, and hopes and memories are pleasant because of them. Now, thinking in itself is concerned with that which is itself in itself best, and thinking in the highest sense with that which is in the highest sense best. Are you confused? We'll keep going. And thought thinks itself through participation in the object of thought for it becomes an object of thought by the act of apprehension and thinking so that thought and the object of thought are the same because that which is receptive of the object of thought as in the essence is thought you see where he's going with this he's understanding the mind right is the most purest goodest bestest <laughs> understanding of reality he recognizes that and he's kind of trying to work through this right and then he says here He's talking about how to how to apprehend with our thoughts uh, the things that of this world. So, but he's still looking it back to what's this one principle, this one, this one thought that's eternal. So he says, um, and it and it actually functions. Oops, let me skip here. And it actually functions when it possesses this object. Hence, it is actuality rather than potentiality that is held to be the divine possession. Possession. Sorry. Possession, possession, divine possession of rational thought and its active contemplation is that which is most pleasant and best. This is where he makes more sense now. <laughs> if then the happiness which God always enjoys is as great as that which we enjoy sometimes, it is marvelous. And if it is greater, this is still more marvelous. Nevertheless, it is so. Moreover, Life belongs to God, for the actuality of thought is life, and God is that actuality. So he's linking mind and goodness and actuality. And he recognizes that there has to be a coherent way of understanding who God is and what is ultimately the, the essential, the essence of what is good. And he continues, well, this is his final sentence. He says, and the essential actuality of God is life most good and eternal. We hold then that God is a living being, eternal, most good, and therefore life and the continuous eternal existence belong to God, for that is what God is. End quote. So he makes this statement, which we'd all resonate with, and he articulated this through. Uh, through reason. Now, there is an argument about you know that uh, that you can you can reason your way to God. Now, we can reason our way through 
the concepts of God through what we determine reality and the fact that we're made in his image, right? We can think God's thoughts after him in a sense, but we ultimately don't know who God is because he hasn't revealed himself apart from Christ. And so unfortunately, um, and, and you know, God's, God's grace is always good. I'm not going to say anything as far as the, the fate of Aristotle, but if he didn't know Christ, I would say that he is not with the Lord right now. Um, but you know, there may have been favor upon him that we didn't see. But anyways, uh, moving on. So Aristotle's conclusion of God, he also refers to as the one and the mind, what I was mentioning about earlier. With the, the, with the monad, the monad as mind, that contemplates the ideas and is the central theme in later Platonism, that the ideas exist in the divine mind. Again, we're talking about the thought, the essence of, of, of the first mover of the one in the mind, because it's understanding that the, the, the thoughts of the mind are, are not corporeal, right? They're essence. And the things that we see around us have to come from some sort of thought. And that's what he's trying to make this connection with here. So he says, the transcendent first principle, also termed God, finds its appeal in later Christian thought in that God would not be God if he were not the source of all being and cause of all matter. Now, uh, I apologize, Aristotle didn't say that, so scratch that part of it, but um, again, I'm going to repeat it. The transcendent first principle, which is what Aristotle kind of came uh, concluded with, right, also termed God, finds its appeal in later Christian thought in that God would not be God if he were not the source of all being and cause of all matter. And that's what Aristotle and Plato hit on. That was the key thing, is that, the, that there has to be a cause of all things, some source that brings everything into reality, that is self-existent, that's eternal, that's happy, that's good, all these things, but they couldn't ultimately locate the, the, uh, um, the Logos piece that we see um, connected to Christ. Drink real quick. Don't. Now the doctrine of God as one is connected to the idea of God as pure being, from which the doctrines of, of divine simplicity and immutability are, are drawn. Uh, the monad as mind implies that the one is the source of all, therefore the one is unoriginate, or we would say ingenerate, right? expressing that the one does not have a beginning or end, is independent of other beings, and is the original source and ultimate cause of all that exists. He who is suggests that the one is a timeless, unchanging being. And we can recognize the same concept in Scripture as recorded in John's Revelation, chapter 1, verse 4, where he writes, from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Now, with the Platonic metaphysic, the early church fathers, almost without exception, had the framework to establish that God is a changeless being, all-powerful, cannot suffer change from anyone or anything or within or without himself. He cannot change for the better, <clears throat> nor can he become worse because he is perfect. So the, the Platonic metaphysics provided the substance and grammar to talk about the God of John's revelation, he who is. Now in this next section, we're going to be moving on to the essentials of Platonism. And it's important to see this because, again, I mentioned earlier that there are those that have a real or have, find it troubling to somehow say Platonism is Christian. And, and again, we're not saying that's the case, but it is true that all truth is God's truth. And that's what's important to understand is that God has revealed himself in the world to us. Now, he hasn't revealed himself specifically apart from Christ, but there's obviously a, a manner of thinking. You know, we're made in the image of God. Therefore, we're going to think according to how God thinks but obviously in a creaturely capacity. And so we have a, a means of being able to contemplate uh, the divine essence, which God has given us in creation. And Platonism really provided this, this conceptual thought process of articulating things about the nature of reality behind what we physically see. And ultimately it really helped us shape our ideas of God and Christ and the Trinity. <clears throat> All right, essentials of Platonism. That was super fast. Essentials of Platonism. Sorry, my jaw gets really sore doing this. All right, for Plato, 
The one grand idea or theory is that of forms. F-O-R-M-S, forms. Forms are the ideas from which all material things originate from. They are objective truths, eternal realities that ground material reality. These ideas are bigger than what we can see. We see the, the shadows of an eternal spiritual reality which would leave us in which should leave us in awe and in wonder. There are more things in heaven and earth than we can see. Thus the essential point of Platonism is moreness, transcendence, another kind of reality outside our cave sorry, outside our cave. And the cave concept is what um, Plato talked about in one of his books called The Republic. Um, the, pla the the cave concept was that that we have creatures, obviously humans, that live in this shadow reality in this cave. And all they can see is what's there before them because there's no light. But then there's those that actually go outside outside the cave and see everything that the light illumines. And that's where philosophers want to go, where those that don't love wisdom, that don't love knowledge, don't love looking for those what's behind reality will always just stay in that cave and live in the shadowlands. So, um, hold on a second. So this reality, this platonic reality of transcendence and something beyond ourselves, much of modern thought wants to squash it. So that in reducing the complex to the simple, mankind can conquer it. And we see a lot of that that goes into the Enlightenment period, uh, where we call it the pre-modern times, where man started to get more scientifically and technologically advanced and now started having more control over the material world around him. And so therefore, say, hey, that's what matters. We need to focus on that piece. And he wants to be able to comprehend everything and analyze it again. But he's still only living in the shadow, right? The shadow of immaterial reality. He can't see what's actually out there. So he focuses on what's been created and not the ideas behind it. So Plato sought to be conquered by the greater reality, which he and we, we have no control over. Humanity exists in the ideas. They are not psychological constructs as the modern project claims. Behind the shadows sits an ordered, intelligible, metaphysical reality of universals and particulars that exist within themselves. For example, the color green is always green, independent of things that have the color green. Can you explain to somebody what green is? It's green. Can you explain to somebody what red is? It's red, right? So these things, apart from anything else, have an inherent universality to what they are, right? They come from the ideas that God has. Um, goodness and justice. Even if humanity ceases to exist, those things exist in themselves. The laws of logic. Two plus two equals four. If I were to write the number two on the wall and I erased it off the chalkboard... Would two disappear from, from reality? No, right? They are always true. They're always true. So two plus two always equals four, regardless of the material reality. But the things that have been created, we say, are, are images or reflections of their forms or essences or platonic ideas as has been utilized, right? They are like them or analogous to them. So we wouldn't say that the 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 physical form of something is identical to the immaterial form, the, the form of the thought, right? Um, but ultimately, we live in the Shadowlands, so we cannot comprehend um, that idea specifically. It's it's beyond us, right? We, we weren't made to be able to uh, uh, deal with those ideas because, as we said earlier, we're not in control of those. That comes from the one, right? The, the monadic mind, as we'll use the Platonic philosophy terms right now. So... The whole world that's around us is an image of the world that we do not see. So what is the key difference between Plato and modern contemporary philosophy? Ethics. Ethics. Plato valued ethics like rocks. They are objectively real and unchangeable. Modern philosophy sees ethics like artwork. We create them, and the social and the cultural influx produces variations. Think of you all... Looking in our modern society on social media, we see a lot of this, um, uh, you know, individuality of expressing these thoughts about things that they say that whoever has those thoughts must be true because what's true for that person may be not true for you. But hey, I'm the ground of truth 
And if I want to say this about myself or be this about myself, <laughs> then that's what matters most. That's what's true. So feelings these days are making the rules of what's real, and that's a real problem. So anyways, back to this. So the Platonic world is vast. The modern world is narrow. Plato's large world outside of the cave reveals what the modern world wants to run from, a loss of control. Plato's world of universals means that there are subjective and objective distinctions. The modern paradigm says that what is real or true comes down to preference or a rationalizing of our desires. And th therefore, what is real is subjective. And that is problematic to say the least. See, if there are no objective reasons to believe something is real and objective, then there is no reason for anyone to believe anything at all. The challenge to this way of thinking is the challenge to this way of thinking is who is Freud to determine my beliefs based on his rationalizing? I see I jumped to Freud for some reason, I don't know why, but Freud was obviously a if we know the name, the Freudian slip is the phrase that we use, but he um, was a um, a modern a modern uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, psychologist, same thing. No, not the same thing. But anyways, he was very instrumental in in, in shaping uh, modern psychology with having everything taught to or everything tied to um, sexuality uh, at the at the base of who mankind is. But anyways, okay. So back to why should I let his reasoning speak in Freud? Why why should I let his reasoning, which is only rationalizing of his desires. A fringe upon my belief. Again, it goes back to that whole thing. It said, if there are no objective reasons to believe something is real and objective, then there is no reason for anyone to believe anything at all. Again, why? Why should I believe in Freud? Why should I believe in any uh, psycho, <laughs> psychologist, whatever that is, psychiatrist? Um, his beliefs he formalizes that that's just him just thinking the way he does. There's no objective reality to that or, or objective grounding principle. That's just him rationalizing about things. So why should he let that infringe upon my beliefs? Well, that was a uh, rabbit trail I was not expecting to go on. So if reason is only subjective, then that piece of reason is only subjective too. It's only subjective that it's only subjective. It refutes itself. It commits rational suicide. Therefore, reason must be anchored to an objective reality, principle, or truth. Otherwise, we have no standard of judgment. Now, modern thought determines that the distinction between man and beast is reason. But modern thought defines reason differently compared to how, to, how Plato defines it. While modern thought defines reason, reason as man's ability to be smart, clever, and calculated, Plato defined reason as one having wisdom, understanding, and insight into the forms. This use of reason, Plato divided into four categories or levels, faculties in the soul, as he called them. The first level of knowledge is reason answering to the highest, which is direct insight to the eternal reality, the unchangeable qualitative form of beauty or human nature or life. This knowledge makes man human, separating him from animals and computers. He didn't say that. He didn't know about computers, obviously. The second level of knowledge is understanding, where one attains knowledge through logic and deductive reasoning, deriving quantitative truths dependent on logic, where conclusions depend on their premises. And the third level is faith or conviction, through direct sense experience, where one believes what he assumes in reality without the need to prove it. I should have slides for this stuff, so I do apologize, but I have, I have more slides to come. And this is the level where our objective sense of reality meets actual material objects. And the fourth level is the perception of shadows, which is secondhand knowledge from opinions, reflections, reflections excuse me, and or images of real things. Now, Plato's order of knowledge outlines the ascent of discovery from the mere shadows we see before our eyes to the reality of universals that we can only apprehend with our minds. We can understand eternal necessary truths. We can know essential natures of things. That's what it is to get out of the cave. Plato posited that the reason we can know objective truths like two plus two equals four, 
A triangle has three sides that always add up to 180 degrees. Greenness is green at all times and all places. It's because our minds are in touch with the world of forms. Again, we come from a form and we're made in the image of God and we're based upon these forms. He has an image of us. We are connected to that image and what he's implanted in us as creatures in his image is that ability to be in touch with the world of forms. So ideas like truth and goodness are not produced in our minds. Rather, they come to our minds. Interesting, right? Truth and goodness are not produced in our minds. Rather, they come to our minds. Now, Immanuel Kant, who's a philosopher we might get to later on, he would say the minds are responsible in actually producing the reality before us. That's a really, really kind of uh, wacky way of thought. That had a lot of influence in that time. And in coming to our minds, they, again, the ideas of truth and goodness, they function as a judge for our minds, depending on our mind's conformity to them. So we might say it's a, kind of like a conviction or our conscience, right? If I'm not, if I'm not in, in conformity to truth and goodness, we react to that. We react internally, emotionally, physically. We actually get away from those things and we do things that keep us from, from pulling us back to what is true and good. Why? Because of our fallenness, uh, our, our sinfulness. But that takes us to the question of what kind of mind knows the forms. It is an epistemological question and that we need to articulate what kinds of knowing are there, which allows us to see the metaphysical reality behind the mask of the physical world. Platonic thought observes five kinds of knowing, which all begin with wonder. And I have slides for these. Ooh, go back. Number one, ordinary, unreflective knowing, sense perception and common sense, right? This is the kind of the first kinds of knowing. Next one, scientific knowing in the modern scheme uses proofs of empirical testing and mathematical measurement. So ordinary, unknowing, reflective knowing, sense perception, common sense. Now we're going to the scientific knowing, right? Being able to more or less kind of interact with the world around us. And so the, the aim of this mode of knowing is to determine what works and what can be extracted or used from a particular object or thing. Now the wonder ceases when the object is attained, much like a magician revealing how, revealing how he does a particular trick. The wonder is gone once the secret's revealed. And science wants to remove that element of wonder because, why? It entails the loss of control, which is too steep a price to pay. Third level, philosophical knowledge of reasons and causes by logical reasoning, such as Plato sought after. So science follows a similar path, but wonder ceases when knowledge is attained, but in philosophy, such end is harder to achieve. Number four, wonder within wonder, the contemplation of truths for their own sake, where knowledge in this mode of thought leads to more wonder like that of a child. When we contemplate the idea of eternality, of the world always existing, that is just way too big for our minds, but that, that's that wonder he's talking about. How we see that there's something to what makes a person a person. What what defines humanity? What defines what is true? What is good? What is beautiful? What is just? What is righteous? I mean, we have all these these true concepts that again that we don't form in our minds. Rather, they come to our minds. They come to our minds. So when we see what is true, we don't learn that is true. We recognize that it's true because. It comes to our minds from the one mind, right? To use the term, the one mind, the, our, our, our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, slide six. Nice. Right, number five. Me mystical knowing is the end because nothing else can be suggested. It is an active, actual experience of the ultimate. Now, in the biblical, in the biblical sense, an intimate knowing of another in sexual union. A knowing that is beyond yourself, even out of one's self-conscious. It is our end which cannot be put into words. For it is the whole point of philosophy and indeed of human life itself. We as Christians are looking forward to that day of seeing our God face to face. Now what does that mean? 
Right? We know we're going to be united to God as one body of believers, of his children. And there's going to be a contemplation that we cannot put into words, right? That we can see now in this world, but we can't grasp it yet. And philosophy, philosophy rightly done, is the, the end is that. The end is to get to the one who created all things and who actually revealed himself uh, in a in a manner that there aren't words to describe, but it's a place of complete rest and understanding. The expanded horizon Platonum gives to metaphysics and knowledge has profound implications for the human ethic, thus human existence. The question pertinent to all of humanity is, what ought I do Sorry, what ought I to be and do? <laughs> it's so hard for me to say that. What ought I to be and to do? So basically, that's the question. How can you say you ought to do this to anybody? If there is no foundational human ethic about anything, who can say that? Well, again, we're talking about in metaphysics, and this is my point. That question is grounded in metaphysics. If we were merely bags of flesh formed through random chance processes, which are just nothing more than chemical reactions taking place until they run their course, then all that matters is doing what one can do to meet one's immediate feel-good temporal needs. If nature is the final reality, then meaning and purpose end here. But if one can know the absolute good, then one can judge relative standards by the good, including my soul and the community in which one exists. Seeing the good with our souls and functioning off that objective standard gives humans a foundation of ideas, ideas to judge all other things. If not, then someone else must play God, a tyrannical and idolatrous one. But then again, compared to what standard? Now we're going to move into these platonic ideas, this kind of metaphysical framework now emerging into Christianity and being, again, appropriated. We don't say full scale because I'm, really what I'm covering from the essentials of Platonism isn't the entire philosophical system. It's really it's the key things that were taken from it, right? It's like the, as Augustine used to say, it's the spoils from Egypt. So when, when Israel was, was leaving, was exodusing, exodusing, <laughs> <laughs> was on its exodus out of Egypt, right? They took things with them that the Egyptians gave them, all their goods, the material wealth, uh, all those things, gave, they gave to them on their way out. So Augustine would say that the early church fathers, the early Christians, would are, are, are uh, taking the, the spoils of Egypt when it comes to developing uh, Christian thought. All right. So Platonism and Christianity. Genesis 1.27 is the essence of Platonic thought. Quote, God created man in his own image. Image is fundamental to Platonic ideas because created reality is the image of the eternal spiritual reality. These ideas for Plato are the eternal archetypes and things are the representations of the ideas which Christians, beginning with Augustine, locate in the mind of God. Now, three differences exist between Plato and the Bible. Plato taught that there are abstract eternal essences. The Bible teaches that there is an eternal, single, personal, triune essence, the I am, who is the subject who necessarily exists, not the object, object as Plato's ideas were. Two, in Scripture, Man is a subject, the one who alone is made in God's image. Three, for mankind, the heart, not specifically the mind, is the location of the faculty of loving and choosing. Scripture has examples of Platonizing, such as Jesus in John 4.34, when he says that his food is to do the will of his Father. Here, Jesus is using matter to image spirit. Paul does the same, what we call platonic reversal, when he refers to earthly fathers as images of God the Father and his fatherhood over Christ, from which earthly families are named after, Ephesians 3.14. The human representation of things are metaphors or images. Oh, 
to demonstrate the true spiritual reality. Again, Paul refers to Christ as the image, right? The image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. The word made flesh is the physical image of an immaterial divine being. The Logos is then the culminating principle where, where all wisdom comes from and points creatures back toward, okay, back toward. John identifies Christ as the Logos. Logos has a plethora of meanings, but in John, the Logos is the eternal truth who is born of woman. In Jesus being attributed as the Logos, the idea of the Logos is expanded beyond an abstract understanding or definition as that of reason, logic, or mind. The Logos is in fact personal. Logos has always been the destination for Greek philosophers. So while it has a dozen meanings, they can be brought under three headings. Metaphysical, psychological, and linguistic. I've got more slides for you on this one. All right. So logos means, first of all, realness, essence, form, unity, and principle. When you look up the the BDAG, which is the kind of the the standard for Greek lexical studies, the entry for logos is quite vast, and you find it in all kinds of various literature. And I've already talked about that, but in this context, we're going to say so. Logos, first of all, is realness, essence, form, unity, principle. Right. It also means Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, reason, or logic. Now we think about Christ. He's the Word, right? He's, he's the, he's the, he's the. Uh, scripture says that Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, in First Corinthians one twenty one, I think. But yeah, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. And it also means word, words, language, revelation, or explanation. Again, a lot, a lot of pieces to the term logos. So in these three categories. Logos, number three, is a mind's externalization of number two, as Logos, number two, is a mind's internalization of number one. So what does that mean? So for example, number three, what's number three? And it means word, words, language, revelation, and explanation, right? So number three then reveals, explains externally Number two, what's number two? It also means wisdom, understanding, knowledge, reason, or logic. So then number two, wisdom and knowledge, which is the mind's internalization of number one, form, essence, truth, and universal principles. So how does that flow? So if we go backwards, we get to number three, starting with one. So I can only say words, express words, have language, revelation, right? If it what? If I'm able to internalize internalize um, form, essence, truth, principles. And then number three, I can communicate that. So number one, the Logos is the origin, the origin, right? The number two is where the wisdom understanding is. Number three communicates those things externally um, once they've been contemplated. <clears throat> so we could say in a sense, the thing about God is that Christ is the expression of God. So God having the divine ideas, he expresses his divine ideas in the person of Jesus. So Jesus is the word, but it's also the essence of God. So that way, in the human form of Jesus, we get to see and know and relate to the very essence of God in word form, external word form. So the history of philosophy reflects a denial of these three things. In that pre-modern philosophy, ancient and medieval, centered on metaphysics, which ended in what we call nominalism, or the denial of intelligible universals. Modern philosophy is originated with Descartes and Bacon, centered on epistemology, which resulted in the empirical skepticism of human Kant. And we will talk about these figures later on. They claimed that objective reality, what things actually are in themselves, could never be known. So they were what? They're denying number two, the mind's etern internalization of objective truths. In contemporary philosophy, focus on the philosophy of language, thus manifested in what we call deconstructionism, which is the denial of number three, that words can communicate objective truth. So we see this kind of um, uh, deconstructionism, if you will, right, to what true wisdom was in Platonic thought, and modern philosophy has shaved off those central categories. So now we understand, we, we live in a world that we say that words can't communicate anything anymore. 
I mean, think about what's going on in our in our uh, just in the world around us when it comes to uh, pronouns and people identifying as whatever they want. And it doesn't mean if I call somebody a woman, it actually doesn't mean anything anymore. What is a woman? All right, that's that's where we come. And so we can see philosophy over the years has gone away from these things. Has gone away that. That we we there are there are no universals, which is nominalism. We deny those things. Number two is that those who claim what is universal, what is objective, right, in themselves, that can't be known. So the the mind's internalization of these truths goes out the window. The number three, words can't communicate anything objective. Words are relative, and that's this the spiraling out of control that we've seen in modern philosophy. And so the whole point of what we're talking about is to go back to the philosophy that we've understand up until 200 years ago, that unfortunately modern man wants to just, you know, pulverize. So, so logos now in biblical thought contains all three meanings, essence, thought, and language. And that the logos was made flesh, God incarnate in his divine essence, created all things by his word, by speaking the world into existence. God gave material reality to his divine ideas. And human words, sorry, human words copy the ideas of things. God's ideas come first from which he creates things that are copies of his ideas. I will jump ahead here a little bit, but like Justin, the early church apologist, as he was known, he saw that Plato was an unconscious observer of the pre-incarnate Christ. He understood the Logos was the chief designer, the principle and the truth. The Logos was an impersonal, sorry, impersonal and abstract concept. Again, there was not that special revelation of getting to who was the Logos, not what, but who, who is the Logos. So... From Justin's point of view, Platonism found its fulfillment in Christ, the Logos, the, the mind of God. Thus, from that point on, Logos in philosophy had a radical paradigm shift. The Logos became flesh. Now, Augustine's adaptation of Platonism followed, I'm sorry, allowed him to unlock a vision of God that left him in awe and wonder. That's what philosophy is intended for us to be, to be in awe and wonder of the reality that we cannot see. That supports the reality that we can see. Uh, Aquinas, which we'll talk about later on, he accepts the basic tenets of Plato's ideas, but differs on their independent substantiality. They exist in three places. He says, before things, in things, and after things. Before things as divine ideas, in things as Aristotelian forms, and after things as human concepts. So he kind of more or less has this trajectory of those things in a simplified form, right? So divine ideas forms, and then after things as human concepts. All ideas exist in God's mind. Every created thing is known by God, the universal and the particular before he creates it. God put the external form into things, and we abstracted them from matter in order to bring them into our immaterial intellects. This last aspect is the doctrine of what we call the doctrine of abstraction from Aristotle, added to the doctrine of illumination to explain how eternal forms get into our minds. And again, this is kind of a mixture where um, illumination is, is Augustine's kind of kind of framework, and then abstractions from Aristotle, and ultimately Aquinas comes in later on and and really kind of uh, synthesizes it. I guess maybe kind of a little, a little differently, but I mean. Uh, Aquinas would say he's just piggybacking off of, Aqu of uh, Augustine. Excuse me. So, our active intellect, which extracts extracts the form from the matter, is our participation in and the effect of God's intellect. Thus, matter reveals spirit. The universe is a kind of appetizer for the incarnation. So, it tells us that Platonism has a hermeneutical structure, which Aquinas and the medieval church adopted. Because of the Platonic understanding of symbols and images and shadows functioning as masks for the eternal, immaterial, and spiritual reality, God then wrote two books, one book of nature and the other of holy scripture. Everything earthly, everything earthly was an image of something, the, something of the creator. Again, back to Romans 1, 19 through 20. 
And the scriptures along with the book of nature were, were full of signs which provided a philosophical foundation for the medieval fourfold method of exegesis which fostered a literal and symbolic interpretation of scripture. Now we're not going to get into the whole exegetical piece maybe later on. Um, again, I'm, I'm not really going that route as of right now. I'm just trying to give you a kind of a, a summary overview of where that's gone to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, some of the key things, though, from this exegesis uh, is that, number one, the Old Testament, again, we're talking about um, signs and symbols and that kind of thing. Now, obviously, we see that all through the Bible. We see that through um, the bread and the wine, right, being symbols of, of Christ's body and his blood. So that's kind of the things that we're talking about. And so these two books, kind of sense, kind of work together to point us to the Logos, to the reality of the essence of God. So again, so the first point, we would say the Old Testament pointed to the messianic fulfillment in the New Testament with figures along the way functioning as symbols or signposts of Christ and other later revealed and fulfilled realities. Like for example, Moses is Christ. Exodus symbolizes salvation. The promised land symbolizes heaven. Okay, that's one of the points. Number two, persons and events in the narrative symbolize aspects of ourselves and our current lives. So for example, Peter's confession of Christ then his denial of him, right? We've gone through those things. So that's a way to, that we see things that um, relate or apply to us. Um, next one, number three, events symbolize future or, or sorry, future heavenly events. For example, Jesus heals physical blindness, which symbolizes the healing of our mental and spiritual blindness in the beatific vision in heaven. Oh, over there. So the philosopher, the, <laughs> you need some water again. The philosophical foundation for this method of interpretation is due to the Platonic understanding that words have meaning, events have meaning, which God carries out, and thus events rightly can rightly be seen as words, as signs, not just things. The modern schematic of deconstructionism says that words do not have objective meaning. It denies that words are signs, reducing them down to things that are either the cause or effect of power. A deconstructionist mindset reduces the world around us because if humans depend on words for meaning and truth, then the contemporary scheme shackles people to their caves because they can never justify their assumptions. They cannot follow the path of wonder if words cannot articulate and lead the way to the bigger world. One of Aquinas' most important contributions, which was a crucial distinction added to Platonism, is the doctrine of analogy. Again, the Platonic ideas are the basis of physical reality, with the physical reality pointing back to the eternal reality. Symbolic and literal understanding can't hold together if we don't have the means of talking about them. Then everything is just pointless. You can't really, you can't anchor anything you can't act, sorry, you can't objectively anchor anything by not having this combination. So for, for Aquinas, reality itself was analogical. So the doctrine of analogy is more than words, language, thought, or concepts. Rather, analogies are first of all, whoop, lost my spot. Analogies are first of all in being. Now, we'll get more in Aquinas much later, but being is the ground of all reality. So for example, when we use the word good, it has different connotations when being used as an attribution for God, man, dog, etc. This means that the form of goodness is not univocal, which, which means same voice, one vocal, univocal. So uh, the word goodness has different meanings, right? So, but not different meanings in the sense that good doesn't mean good, but let me, let me flesh this out. I'm probably getting you lost. So let me say it again. So this means the form of goodness is not univocal, the same voice, with only one universal meaning that must be the same when applied to anything. Goodness rather has an analogical predication, which means it is partly the same and partly different, but used in con contexts that are different. So for example, a good weapon kills. A good medicine heals. Now, will we say killing someone's good? No. But we would apply good to the weapon if the weapon successfully does what it was made for, to kill somebody. So, 
a good weapon kills, and then medicine, right? Medicine is intended to heal somebody. We'd say healing is always good no matter what. A good medicine heals. So what we can see, the basic element of existence is being. This fundamental principle is the separation between God and creatures, and it is analogical. Now we're trying to move to the analogical thought between God and man, right? So according to Aquinas, God is being. We as humans have being. God's essence and existence are necessary. <clears throat> Creatures must be given essence and existence. See the difference between two? So God is necessary. Creatures are not. We would say God is being. God is, right? And creatures have been. We not. We are not is. We have. What we have has been given to us. God has nothing given to him. Otherwise, there would be what? Something before God. That gave God what he is to be who he is. And ultimately, we void what's called the doctrine of divine simplicity. But we'll talk about that later on. Okay. So so God gives existence to a thing's essence by creating it. We can conceive of a strange creature, its essence, but it is only its existence that actualizes its essence. Whereas God is pure existence and essence. So the idea of, human, of someone that's a human person, so humanity, right? Um, a, hum a human, humanity exists in the mind of God, but to actually become what it is, to, it has to exist. So we can have thoughts of a unicorn in our minds, but to really be a unicorn, that thought has to actualize into a physical, a physical thing for us, right? Um, <clears throat> but God is pure existence and essence. He he is immaterial. He's incorporeal. He is existence itself because he necessarily has to be. So even for me to say existence, right, God has to have always been no matter what. He cannot come into existence because, again, something had to have made God then and bring it into being. And we're going through this whole infinite regress again. So Aquinas' distinction between existence and essence is a crucial addition to Plato's theory of forms or ideas. And it came from the biblical revelation of creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing. Creation from nothing is not a platonic concept. It's actually a Judeo-Christian doctrine. For Aquinas, God knows all essences, for they all exist in his mind. And then he chooses to give existence to an essence. Now, when we talk about the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, many mistaken to say, well, God just makes something from nothing. Well, that's illogical, and it is. But we're saying that that creation comes from God alone. We as creatures, we don't create things from our thoughts. We take existing materials that are already here, and then we try to, in a sense, take the thoughts that we have and put them upon these material things and bring something into existence that way. But again, we're only using material things. So when I think of, for example, when we think of a, a chef makes an amazing, amazing course of food. All the ingredients, everything, right? That that course, that food is only so good because of the ingredients that the cook, very good as a cook, took and created this for somebody else. God's not that way. He created the ingredients. He created the thought, the concept, the ideas of trying to put this food together to give pleasure to somebody else through eating food. That comes from God. So again, God alone is the creator of everything that exists in the world itself. And the world itself, obviously. So, uh, back here. So, in Plato, all essences are actually... Sorry. In Plato, all essences are an actual eternality. Don't know why I wrote it that way, but... Anyways, okay. Actual eternality. Eternally. Aquinas and Plato share in the understanding that all possible forms are located in the mind of God. Aquinas did not subtract anything from Plato. Rather, he made an addition based upon the biblical doctrine of creation. You see what I was saying, how there was this appropriation of, of certain concepts, and then we have thinkers of the Christian faith, very, very well-known thinkers, that now make ad additions and, and tweak things based upon creation, based upon revelation from Scripture. Now, we're kind of going to close there, but real quick before before this is going to be our last our last section because after after this we're going to now move into understanding the doctrine of God in early church. But first we need to look at um, a character named Philo of Alexandria. So Philo, so born in 25 BC, died around AD 40. He was a Hellenistic Jewish philosopher 
whose thought presents the first major confrontation of biblical faith with Greek thought. He was the son of a prominent Alexandrian family. He was very well educated in the Jewish faith, but also in Greek philosophy and culture. And again, Hellenization was a, was a process that was happening before the scriptures. I mean, that's because the, the Greek thought was, was pervading the land as the Romans and the Greeks moved in, obviously, and that became part of the society, was to ultimately Hellenize, to take the Greek the Greek understanding of things, and now infiltrate the culture and have everybody thinking and seeing in the same way. So, back to Philo. So he's an interesting figure because he, it seems scholars either love him or hate him, and that some credit him with radically altering the Old Testament view of God, thus they would say plunging the Judeo-Christian faith into pagan philosophy. Uh, Philo's view... Philo. Philo's view of the God of the Pentateuch is that of one who is intimate and, provi- and provident, unlike the gods espoused in Neoplatonism. Again, there's there's good things that we're pulling out, but things that we're leaving. A tenet of Greek philosophy is the view that the universe is eternal, but Philo does not believe as such because it runs contrary to the Old Testament teaching of God's providence over his creation. Again, Philo is seeing things that we recognize in creation and around us, but then what becomes his safeguard is what scripture allows, what scripture teaches. And so we don't override that. We allow the biblical doctrine now to be the safeguard on what we philosophize about and, and, and try to abstract. Now, in his commentary on Genesis, Philo reflects on God's good creation, in which God determined to bring about a corporeal world, right? A material world, which is perceptible to the external senses. And based off this, we have this called archetypal idea of creation conceived in God's intellect. So God, as the cause of all things, is indescribable. In fact, the living God, writes Philo, is so completely indescribable that even those powers which minister unto him do not announce his proper name to us, end quote. God's revealing of himself to Moses as I am who I am in Exodus 3, 4 conveys his holiness and holy otherness as creator. And because of God's incomprehensibility, the light of God is imperceptible to the physical senses. But the eye of the soul can receive the impression of his appearance and therefore, but cannot be named. Um, That was actually a parenthetical note there. Sorry about that. But so Philo understands that we can only know that God exists. However, We can know God through his relationality and that he gives us a name for which we are called are to call upon so that man can be brought into relation with him, connecting his personal nature to the one who sovereignly creates. Again, we have these philosophical concepts that provide a a level of speaking of truth. And then the biblical text, the revelation of God in scripture now allows us to shape in a manner to where we can kind of come to these conclusions, but scripture ultimately has the final say. But we can see how how the philosophy kind of kind of kind of brings some fullness to these theological um, structures. All right, conclusion. Oh, I didn't. Oops, sorry. Okay. So the brief survey on Greek philosophy, particularly Platonism, purpose to identify some key concepts that function and still do function in the framework of the early Christian doctrine of God. Uh, we will refer, sorry, I'm just learning how to do the slides here. Sorry. We will refer to this and other aspects of Greek philosophy and Western philosophy in general, particularly strains of thought that deviated from the Christian tradition. But before moving on, it's important to understand, unlike many modern critics of the use of philosophy in the early church, the, fa- the fathers did not accept Greek philosophy uncritically. It's important. They did not use philosophy as the primary means to articulate and teach about the God of the Bible. Rather, they adapted what undergirded the Bible's teaching about God. We cannot escape the use of philosophy. Rather, we need to subject it to the documents of the faith. If it does not align with the scripture, then we cast it out. Second century philosophy found more and more favor with Christianity in that while it posited that God was impassable, ungenerated, invisible, immutable, incomprehensible, and immeasurable, the Christian scriptures, the revelation of God, transcended philosophy because knowledge of the Father, 
what's positive about him, could only come by means of the prophets who were led by the Spirit. Thus, Christian theology is divine doctrine, not of human origin. So, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, thanks for listening, uh, watching, participating. Um, the next lecture, we'll be actually get into um, our survey of the early church fathers, seeing how exegesis, metaphysics, and a commitment to the triunity of God as the sovereign Lord, first cause, and redeemer in Christ Jesus shaped their understanding of the essence and attributes of the one true God of the Bible. Thanks again. Good night.